official public lecture by Dr. Hati Basri on Al Hill from the Australian National University. Uh, as is customary with uh, public events at this university, we start by acknowledging and celebrating the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and pay our respects to the elders of the Nangawa people past and present. It's a very great pleasure to introduce uh, one of uh, ANU's finest products, and that is uh, uh, the Dr. 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 Hati Basri. Um, Dr. Dr. Basri is one of three uh, wonderful and distinguished friends from Indonesia visiting and speaking this week. They include His Excellency former Vice President Dr. Buriono and uh, Ibu, Dr. Ibu Mari Pangestu, who gave a brilliant, scintillating lunchtime lecture. So thank you to our, our Jakarta friends who've come to this, uh, this uh, wonderful event celebrating 50 years of the Indonesia project and coming especially during a really cold uh, Canberra winter. So let me just say a few words about uh, Dede, because I've had the pleasure of knowing him for, knowing him for quite a few years. Uh, Dede had a stellar academic uh, career here in Canberra, and actually his personal life he was pretty good as well, <laughs> if I may say. Uh, his, his, his reputation from Indonesia preceded him. We heard very good things about him from several <coughs> colleagues in, in Jakarta, and of course we weren't disappointed. Uh, he, he flew through the pretty tough uh, ANU graduate economics program with great distinction. Uh, and then he wrote a very interesting PhD thesis on the political economy of manufacturing protection in Indonesia. We've since watched, watched his career with, with great, great pride and interest as he quickly established himself as a central figure in Indonesia's intellectual and, and policy life uh, since he returned from his uh, dissertation in 2001. Uh, it's, it's also a career which I'm sure, given his age, there's much else to follow, but already he's held two cabinet-level positions. In 2012-13, he, uh, he was director, executive director of the Adam Cordenas and Banana the Capital Investment Board, a cabinet-level position. And then he had the really tough one, the job of Minister of Finance, 2013-14, uh, of course, a, a post which Akuriona also held with great distinction for some time. Uh, I think it's fair to say that a feature of Dede's work is both the breadth and the depth of, 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 of work. Uh, he's one of the very few economists I know who covers broad canvas comfortably. He can talk about international macroeconomic issues, he can link, link them to the Indonesian context, and he's also done a lot of very interesting and careful, but much more micro-empirical research. So he, he covers a lot of bases and he covers it with great distinction. Uh, he also extends his work to the political economy issues, and not the political economy, which is the common kind of you know, taxi driver claptrap, but serious analytical uh, political economy issues. So uh, I've always valued very much the times we've had with him, and it's a great pleasure to uh, welcome you here. Uh, you, you were speaking here earlier in the year, I think in this room actually, in, I think it was uh, April or May, uh, he gave a public lecture last year. We've been very fortunate that that has uh, come to ANU quite often, and we welcome you back again today with great interest and anticipation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Noel, for a very kind introduction. I don't believe that it was me you were talking about because <laughs> you were just too kind to me. We are part of the MES, the Mutual Admiration Society. <laughs> so it's my life, scratch his back. He used to be my, my supervisors and also uh, an old friend, especially related to discussion about the most important one, about wine. <laughs> um, um, a very good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure to be here. First of all, I would like to congratulate uh, Indonesia Project for uh, the 50th anniversary. And uh, this evening, I would like to share uh, our paper, actually, because I wrote a joint paper together with Samsura Harja and also Mira. And this paper will appear in the Asian Economic uh, uh, Paper Journal in the forthcoming. Uh, is related about the issue of the middle income trap. But I'm not really um, convinced with the concept of the middle income trap. 
That is why the title of this presentation, not a trend, but slow transition. So Indonesia pursuing the high income status. Um, if you look at the history of the journey of the Indonesia project, back on 1965, perhaps one would uh, wonder whether Indonesia could survive you know, for the economic development. If you recall the famous Gunnar Mirda, yeah, with his famous book on the Asian drama, uh, he wouldn't believe that Indonesia would survive because Indonesia was trapped on the so-called low-level equilibrium because Indonesia <coughs> was not able to implement the modern uh, development strategy. And if you look at the survey of recent development, uh, written by uh, late Professor Ahn and also late Professor Park Lake in 1966, um, I don't see any hope for Indonesia to survive yeah, at the time. And I recall I was, I was a student here in 1998 in the Indonesia project uh, organized a conference. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, most of friends still remember that. And we came up with the one conclusion that the prospect of this country would be very gloomy because the prospect, the possibility of colonization, we are not ready for the direct presidential election, the political turmoil, um, also the economic prospect was really bleak at the time because we had the minus 30% economic growth. So if you look at the development of Indonesia in the last 50 years, um, it's a very interesting. The question is whether we'll be able to proceed to become to high income countries. And this is the topic that I would like to discuss uh, this evening. So I, I, I mentioned about the, the Indonesia experience uh, complex and difficult reform. <coughs> Indonesia has made a significant progress. And I think it is a bit unfair to compare Indonesia with Malaysia or Thailand or Singapore or Korea because none of them actually took the Big Bang reform at the same time. So, um, because in 1998 we took the political reform and economic reform at the same time. Perhaps the close competitor for Indonesia would be Philippines because they did the political reform and economic reform at the same time. And maybe at the different scale would be some countries in the Eastern Europe when they do a sort of like, you know, the big bang policy on both economic and political reform. Of course, it's not comparable with Russia. But if you look at our experience, it's quite impressive. We had a negative growth of minus 13% in 98. But a few years after that, um, Indonesia doing relatively well. We, we are able to sort of like to manage the economic growth. And in the last 10 years, for example, the economy has grown by the average 5.8% per year. And per capita income has increased from approximately 1,200 US dollar to become uh, 1,800 uh, uh, we are developing in 2013, and if you're talking about nominal GDP, we are talking about 3,500 US dollars. So, so the, the result is quite remarkable. And this growth has pushed Indonesia into the group of the so called middle income countries. But then, uh, a lot of studies come that remind Indonesia there is a possibility that the country may trap on the so called situation, the middle income trap. Um, but some Studies done, for example, by uh, ADB and also uh, Wilson, Waiter, and Rambari um, came up with a very uh, optimistic view about the future of Indonesia. And even um, this morning, I was uh, interviewed by SBS, and one of the questioners uh, in 2050, Indonesia will become five largest economies in the world. Yeah, so. So, a sort of like, you know, the mixed picture, because there is a possibility of a middle income trap, but also uh, a very um, encouraging development and also, you know, uh, positive future. But we have to, the, the most important question is we have to look at the political reality, yeah, the reality check. Because if we want to pursue for the continuation of the economic growth, I'll, I'll explain to you later on, we somehow need to probably to change the paradigm. Why is that? Because I do believe the resource boom is over. Yeah, we cannot continue to rely only on natural resources, commodity. We experienced that this is several times in the case of Indonesia. 
At the same time, we are also in the crossroad because we maybe we cannot continue to rely on their cheap labor because countries like Bangladesh, uh, their um, wages for workers probably only one third compared to us. So if you want to stay in the garment business, we cannot compete with Bangladesh in related to the cheap garment. But perhaps we need to come up with a better design, a good quality product. So basically a price quality adjustment. So, but if we want to do this, there will be a needs of technology spillover in intra-industry that may come from the foreign direct investment. But sometimes the policy shows that the opposite. We are not very welcome to the, uh, to the uh, foreign investor, we are not very open for trade and FDI regime, and can government deliver the reform? That will be the, the interesting question. And on the political side, the presidential system with the multi-political parties, with making the policy become not easy, become not easy. I'll explain to you later on, based on my uh, experience in the government, you know, uh, dealing with the, we are not talking about the first best world. In economics, we keep talking about the, the first best world, but the reality is we're probably talking about, I don't know, uh, third best or even fourth best. I remember that it is Johnson, if I'm not mistaken, who said that we are living in the second best world and running by the third best bureaucracy. And that's the reality. Yeah. So if you are in the second best or the, maybe the third best situation, never come up with the poor quality of policy like in the Star Wars. If the institutional setup still in the Jurassic Park, then you need to come up with the quality of policy that could be implemented under the Jurassic Park institution. Otherwise, your policy. You know. So one of the uh, issues that we have to look at the uh, political institution as well. The role of actors make reform become more difficult. Uh, but fortunately, we are quite happy because somehow Indonesia is tied with the uh, agreement that already made related with AFTA, with EPEC, that really prevent us for the backtracking related to the reform. So even though I know uh, many colleagues here in ANU is not a big fan of the uh, regional trade arrangement, they prefer for the multilateral. Yeah, but I can see the benefit of the, the uh, regional uh, arrangement, at least to prevent us to follow backtracking. And a country like Indonesia need that one. So let me, and this is the question to be addressed, whether Indonesia is able to speed up the transition from middle income to high income country in a relatively short period of time. And the next question is, what efforts needs to be undertaken to ensure that the process is accomplished in a reasonable amount of time? Um, so let me start with the short-term problems because there will be a sort of like trade-off between the short-term and the medium-term. I believe this afternoon, uh, Ibu Mari discussed already about the short-term issue, about the recent development in Asia, so I won't touch this issue very much. But one thing that I would like to share with you, that is we are facing a problem of, um, this is basically, I try to summarize the the current economic uh, situation under this chart. So we, we, we are facing the global or the external situation with us not really encouraging because we, we have to face the possibility of the Fed or raising the interest rate high uh, soon. At the same time, we also face the slowdown of China, the declining oil prices, that makes become, you know, uh, the issue become very complicated. So we'll see what's going to happen in Indonesia under this kind of situation. If let's say the Fed raise the interest rate soon, then there is a risk of the capital outflow because risk of the asset repricing. And I could imagine the reaction from Bank Indonesia in order to maintain the stability of the exchange rate, they may have to at least to maintain the interest rate or raise the interest rate. But if that's the case, it will slow down the growth. At the same time, if Bank Indonesia lower interest rate and government expand fiscal, then there will be a sort of like continuum of the excess rate depreciation. Yeah? Uh, the slowdown of China will have a major impact on us. Why? Because China is one of the major uh, trading partners for Indonesia. So I could imagine that the, the slowdown of China will have an impact not only to slow down our export, but also the declining commodity prices, because most of our product that we export to China is basically primary and intermediate. And unfortunately, 60% of our export is energy and commodity related. So once China slow down, 
it will be a double blow for us. The direct impact through the declining export, uh, the second one through the declining commodity prices. So this will have an impact not only on exports but also on the government revenue. So I could imagine on the fiscal side there will be a problem because the ability of the government to collect the tax will be quite substantial. At the same time, the government would like to expand for the infrastructure project. So there will be a sort of like, you know, issue of the trade of maintaining the stability and also the economic growth at this stage. Um, so what will be the, the solution for this? If we want to grow, to expand the economic growth, but at the same time, we want to maintain the stability, there's only, at least this is what I have in mind, there's only one uh, possible solution is we could afford to have this uh, current income deficit relatively high, as long as on the capital account it's financed by foreign direct investment. But if we have the current account deficit financed by portfolio investment, then there is a risk of the capital outflow. Yeah, I remember, you know, I keep saying this, when I studied <coughs> in the EU, I was taught that you don't need to worry about current account deficit. So I thought I was right, and when I was a minister of finance, I thought to worry about the current account deficit, because the market said differently. When the current account deficit hit 4.4%, immediately, you know, they pull up the portfolio uh, from Indonesia. But I don't think that we need to worry about the current account deficit, as long as on the capital account is financed by the foreign direct investment. But again, if we want to attract the foreign direct investment, we need uh, reform on the various sectors, including on the, on the uh, investment regime and also on the, on the, on the trade regime. Yeah. So uh, what we did, actually, if we look at you know, our, our experience uh, in the past in 2014, basically, we tried to sort of like to manage the situation by <coughs> the textbook called, I learned it is from the ANU, the so-called expenditure switching and expenditure reducing policy. If you are facing a problem with the current account deficit, what you need to do is you tighten the fiscal, tighten the monetary policy, and that access it to depreciate. That's basically what we did in 2013. Yeah, when we had a, you know, the, uh, we are facing a problem of the tapering time in the US at the time, and we had the problem of the current account deficit. So basically, we choose the strategy stabilization over growth. Of course, the difficult part is how to, or to, to Pagudion is relatively easy because he will support me. But how to convince the president to accept the slow down of growth <laughs> nine months before the election? It, it wasn't an easy, an easy job to sort of like, you know, to convince. Because we had a problem in, it was on June 2013, but we had an election on April 2014. So the president should accept to slow down the growth in order to ensure the macroeconomic stability, to let the excess rate to depreciate. So um, it's not easy. When I, I spoke to Pablo Diono, it's much easier to convince him immediately. He said that this is the thing that uh, we need to do. But that is basically back to the to the the, the old textbook regarding expenditure switching and expenditure reducing policy. And I think we've been quite successful in terms of this. At least I don't read the local newspaper because they criticize me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so at least when I read the article in The Economist, they said, uh, fragile no more, Indonesia fleeing is a fragile five, as the CAD uh, narrows. <laughs> and this is the thing that I like. You know? um, <coughs> the fragile five has become the fantastic five. That's the New York Times set. So at least, you know, by implementing all this policy, we are able to sort of like to manage the, the macroeconomic stability. But this is not enough. Why? Because the main issue later on is if we continue with the stability of our growth, then Indonesia cannot continue to achieve the 7% economic growth in the future. And that is an interesting, this is the, the coefficient correlation that I tried to. Uh, I try to avoid the econometrics uh, exercise. Because every time I come up with the econometric exercise, the discussion will go into the R square, all the test, the test, which is already for the So I came up with this you know, coefficient correlation. The interesting part is there is a strong correlation between investment and imported capital goods. 
92% of our import is made up of capital goods and raw materials. What will be the implication? It, uh, uh, the implication is, if we want to increase our investment, then the implication is the import will also increase. So it means that increase in investment will have an impact on the current account deficit. This is basically uh, the, the two gap Chenery circuit, you know, classic model. Yeah, that you know, if you if you increase the investment, there will be a problem on the on the on the current account deficit. So what will be the solution? Of course, the short term solution is people may become pragmatic and they said that if you want to sort of like to face the problem of current account deficit, just cut the import. You impose tariff. You import protection. But it doesn't help. It doesn't help at all. Because by doing this, you kill the investment. Once you kill the investment, then you cannot have growth. But how can we sort of like to sort of like to improve the situation? So let me come up with a very um, conventional, this is the easiest way to, to explain, uh, about the incremental capital output ratio. In Indonesia, the incremental capital output ratio now is about 5.3. So 1% economic growth will require investment over GDP probably about 5.3%. So if we want to grow by 7, we need investment over GDP perhaps around 37%. And our savings, domestic savings, is only about 32%. So it means that 7% economic growth will have an implication of the current account deficit about 5%. So there is no way we could achieve the 7% economic growth without jeopardizing the current account deficit. The solution is, is not curbing the import, but improve the productivity. So it means that we lower the uh, capital, uh, and, uh, uh, incremental capital output ratio by improving <coughs> productivity. Yeah, if we can have this I core for about 4%, uh, 4 for example, with 7% economic growth, we only need investment over GDP by 28%. So the issue is how to improve the productivity. And here is the, the, the thing that I would like to touch for the medium and the longer term. Look at this. Indonesia's evolution of relative free income, steady but slow. If you make a comparison about Indonesia, India, Malaysia, Philippines, and Taiwan, not too bad, actually. Of course, if we compare to, you know, to um, a country like, like, like Malaysia, we are less than, you know, uh, uh, less than Malaysia. But if we compare to even India, Philippines, and Taiwan, yeah, um, uh, Indonesia doubled its relative income per capita compared to the 1970s, but it took 40 years. So that's relatively slow. Similar pattern with the middle income countries in Southeast Asia, except Philippines. And the 1997 financial crisis had a devastating impact on the Indonesian economy. We almost reached to become the middle income countries and the high income countries, but the 97 crisis really hit us. Yeah. And declining commodity prices should be an opportunity for Indonesia to take actions. I'll explain later on about the, the reverse effect of the Dutch disease, that the policy <coughs> is probably a good benefit. And bad times makes good policy, and will Indonesia be able to push reform in the 80s? I hope this will happen again. I'm afraid that you know, bad times will create a bad policy. Yeah? And I know my colleague, Tarianto Patun, who is working on the Interesting uh, paper on the bad times makes it good, uh, makes a bad policy. Um, uh, let me move. So we try to do sort of like you know identification about how Indonesia, whether Indonesia will be able to sort of like to improve productivity. But what I'm afraid, this paper shows that when we try to look at about this, um, if you look at the chart, I don't want to be very technical on this. This chart is basically uh, to show. For the same product that become relevant, what is the position of Indonesia? Whether Indonesia will continue to produce a relevant product in the global world or not? And if you look at the case, it shows that Indonesia, um, the role of Indonesia's manufacturing in the global world is declining in the sense that it will become less relevant. We continue to produce product which become less relevant in the global economy. So we are, there is a risk of being small fish in the large part of the global manufacturers. But if you look at Thailand from 1992, and also Malaysia and India, the sort of like you know, uh, improvement. For the case of Indonesia, there is a risk of it. Because you know, the ability to produce product which is relevant 
in the development of the global world is continue to decline. And we try to do sort of like to, to look at about the extensive and intensive margin. And I was quite surprised because in terms of technology, no self-discovery. Yeah, if you look at this, most of the, our export product uh, that we, the product that we exported, perhaps 70% is focused on the intensive margin. Intensive margins means that you just focus on the similar product to the same market. Yeah? Uh, but if you look at the new products to the new market, and also this company, it's relatively small. So it means that Indonesia continues to stay in the similar product. So in the beginning I mentioned about we probably have to change the paradigm, we cannot rely continue to rely on natural resources, on the cheap labor. But the reality is we haven't we are not ready yet to shift into that kind of uh, you know uh, uh, paradigm. When I talk about the technology, it uh, doesn't mean that we need to create a sort of like, you know, an aircraft industry. We can continue the government product. We can continue the government business. What we need to do is to improve the quality of talking design, so improvement of the, of the, of the quality. Yeah? And this is the thing that I, I understand, you know, when I presented this paper about a couple of months ago, one of the colleagues, I don't know whether Chandra is here, he criticized the way we calculate this, we are using the, the Hausman index. And based this Hausman index, if you look at this Hausman index, it shows that uh, Indonesia is not able to produce a product with this relatively complicated. Yeah? <coughs> so if products could not be made in Indonesia, what else can they be made? And from the observed data, Indonesia made a progress in improving capability of export products requiring more complex tasks. But if you look at this, on this chart, yeah, um, our capability to undertake complex tasks is still behind other middle income countries. So it means that we probably need to focus on the quality of the human capital. And this is the thing that we probably need to focus when we are talking about the so-called middle income track. Yeah. And then this is the thing that I'm, I'm, I'm very I'm really worried about. Look at the uh, PISA test score in 2012. Look at the math and science. We cannot compare with India because there's only one uh, province in India, is Pradesh. But Indonesia is probably the lowest compared to Brazil, China, Malaysia, Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam on the score of math and science. Yeah. So this is really the, the big issue that we really have to look at it. Yeah, that is why uh, when I was at the MOF, I was really passionate to sort of like to support the scholarship program. We call it the LPDP. Any one of you got a scholarship of LPDP here? If I'm bringing you, oh, I'm glad. You got so, so, well. <laughs> <laughs> so let me give a sort of like you know um, tell about this this the scholarship. This scholarship is available for any Indonesian got accepted in the top 200 universities. Yeah, we, we put uh, allocated the endowment fund, two billion US dollars, and we invested in the government bonds with a yield eight percent per annum. So every year we got 150 uh, million uh, US dollars for a scholarship, and this is enough, you know, to cover for the tuition fee. So I don't want to hear again that any Indonesian get accepted in the top 200 universities. They cannot go simply because the scholarship is not available. Yeah. And, and, and I think this is very important. I, I do understand that you know, it doesn't mean that if you send people to study overseas, overseas, that immediately they will improve the human quality because it takes one generation. The short-term solution is would be perhaps to invite the foreign direct investment because the technology spillover will have this sort of like, you know, will improve, uh, at least they get exposure, how to sort of like to uh, do business, do the management, etc. And this is the thing that I'm, I'm worried about. So that is why one of the issues that we need to focus on the, mid, uh, the medium and the longer term is more on the quality of human resources. It sounds cliche, but this is very important. There were three countries entered the middle income in the 1970s. It was Korea, South Africa, and Brazil, and only Korea managed to be out of the so-called uh, middle-income track at the time. 
because they emphasize on the issue of innovation and also the human capital. The other thing that I would like to touch is escaping from that disease. Yeah, and I think I can see there's uh, big opportunities now. The depreciation of rupiah will somehow this will give an incentive to incentivize the manufacturing sector to improve, shift from the natural resources into manufacturing, declining commodity will see investment to manufacturing. But we probably need the flexible labor market or attract and to export oriented manufacturing. We need to improve the infrastructure and also the human capital. So basically, this is the thing that the policy and decision that probably we need to prepare. In the short term, dealing with this current issue, we're probably dealing about the aggregate demand, about this macroeconomic stability, the fiscal side, um, cash transfer, cash flow work, tax incentive for the companies, and handling the slowdown of economic growth. But in the medium term, infrastructure, human capital, I mentioned the LPAP program here, attract FDI for the technology spillover, is a very important one, because there is no way, we said, I think there is one interesting paper written by Ricardo Hausman. He's very skeptical, he said that there is no evidence that education helps economic growth. And his latest paper also, he said that there is no guarantee that a country free from corruption uh, to grow higher than other countries. Yeah. Uh, Hausman is always skeptical about the thing that we, we always accept as the, you know, uh, the truth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the question is, is it possible to implement all these <coughs> policies? Talking about infrastructure, human capital, attract FDI, incentive for the R&D, etc. Yeah. For example, like, like in the um, uh, training program, it's better to ask the company to do training rather than government to provide the money. In the case of Indonesia, I don't know, um, let me be frank and open with you. Uh, many graduates from the government training center need to be retrained again. Because the equipment is not free. Yeah, it's not, not really updated. So it's better to ask the private sector to do a training and can give a tax deductible because more on the sort of like, you know, more on the job training. But this is not easy, yeah, because against whether the political economy allow us to do so. And look at this. If you look at this chart, it's a very interesting. We start from uh, the Jakarta, Beijing, Pyongyang in the 1960s with Sukarno and, and <coughs> Mao Zedong at the time. And we started with ASEAN. So our, our relationship to become open, inward looking is always ups and downs. And also in 1994, Pahar mentioned it is inevitable that we have to accept globalization. But if you look at this chart, when Mr. Kamdesu, sort of like the, you know, the famous, infamous picture, this, then the resistance come because people think it was the IMF who sort of like pushed us for the economic liberalization. But uh, it's quite interesting. In 1998, there was a lot of resistance against the, uh, you know, uh, the IMF, the World Bank. But in 2008, we joined the G20 leaders meeting in Washington. Yeah. So if you look at the process, we could see the tug of war between the uh, inward looking and also the outward looking. Why is that? I try to do the taxonomy like. Uh, Daniel Rodriguez's model of the, uh, you know, the contribution, because the, the, basically the theory says that every reform will be supported by every actor. Yeah. So if you look at the actors, the technocrat, the policy stance says they're pro-reform, but number of tech actors are limited. Only few of the technocrats in the cabinet, in any cabinet besides the under Suharto perhaps. Yeah. But if you look at after the, the. Uh, 1998 uh, reform, perhaps the number of technocrats are very limited. If you ask about politician, the rationale, the objective, correct me if I'm wrong, will push reform as long as they don't jeopardize the interests of the political parties. Yeah, so it's a very sometimes populist policy. It really depends. It depends on the survey. If the survey says this is bad, and the policy cannot be implemented. You know? And bureaucracy, they prefer the status quo. Media, civil society, if you're talking about the open up the foreign direct investment, the trade business, 
they are divided. Some group of them you know, supported the reform, but the rest, if you look at from this taxonomy, I'm afraid I'm rather pessimistic about it. Why? Because um, you know, the, the actors who continue to provide for reform is only the group of them. Yeah. And then, so we cannot really expect politician, bureaucracy, media, and even civil society. <coughs> so the question is, if the strength of the political institution continue, then maybe it takes time for Indonesia to get the level of the high income countries. But not yet the fact, but I do believe that maybe we have to look at this issue care carefully, especially in relation to the political economy. Or we probably need to manage to combine that policy should be politically sound, should be economically sound and politically you know, acceptable. And I could imagine that one of the policies that economically sound and politically acceptable is infrastructure. Because I don't think any government in the world will refuse to support infrastructure. What else? Human capital. I've never heard that any politician say that education is not important. Yeah. The health issue. So probably focusing on the human capital somehow will help us on sort of like dealing with this kind of issue. So I stop it here. Uh, thank you very much. So if there are any questions, I'll certainly be happy. Thank you very much. Uh, there's, uh, there's an illuminating, uh, broad ranging, and very thoughtful talk. Uh, it sort of reminded me listening at lunchtime to Kari Tagestu and this evening to, uh, to Dede uh, how fortunate uh, what the cabinet was of Pat Estewa and Pat Woody to have people of this calibre in the cabinet who can think across a lot of issues. Uh, I kind of, you ended up being a bit pessimistic earlier, I kind of feel a bit optimistic because. The agenda's there. The agenda laid out by Igor Mari, the agenda laid out by Pandemic just now, I think it's a very clear one. In the end, I had this naive sort of view that in the end, good ideas win. So let's hope the good ideas do win. Okay, we have a little bit of time for people for a name. It's now open for, for questions. Uh, please identify yourself. And do we have mics? Do we have some roaming mics somewhere? No. He's, he's a very promising student because he got a BSC for LKT. Okay, so let's start with. We've got a question right off the back. Uh, Donnie, can you go? It looks like it looks like you're to all my Chris Manning. So um, we've got another one here. So please indicate if you have a question. Eddie, I wanted to take up the issue of technology transfer and human resource development and link it a little bit to what Bumari talked about today. Um, Bumari talked about uh, bringing Indonesians back from overseas. And that was one of the strategies that the Koreans and the Taiwanese developed. They sent them overseas and then they worked in American companies and so on. Indonesia doesn't want to do that, it seems. You want to get them back. So these brilliant guys that are, are studying in Australia, they, they go back. Uh, but Indonesia <coughs> also doesn't want to have foreigners working in Indonesia. That's the Singapore and Malaysian model. Uh, bringing in foreigners, working with uh, locals, and then eventually sending them back. So I, I wanted to ask you, I mean, if you don't choose either of those routes, how do you develop the human resources uh, with, with, within companies, within public institutions, and, and within universities? This is a tough question, Chris, because let me share with you um, <coughs> about the, the debate, the discussion about the LPDP program. Because initially, I, at the time, I even thought that uh, LPDP scholar doesn't need to return to Indonesia. Yeah, now, if you get a scholarship from LPDP, after you complete your degree, you need to return to Indonesia. I don't mind to have a brain drain. Why? Because I don't think Bangalore will exist without the Silicon Valley. California. So at that time, the idea is perhaps, you know, let the student to sort of like to get a scholarship and work overseas and later on we'll have a connection. But of course, this is something that's politically unacceptable. You give the money to the student, 
they don't you know, come back to Indonesia, then become uh, very difficult. So I agree with you. We probably need to attract them, but you know, if this 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 program will not require them to stay, yeah, perhaps the things that we can do is to put Indonesia in the part of the supply chains, in the part of the production network. So once the Indonesian company uh, related to the, let me give an example about the auto industry. Yeah, this is a very interesting development because if you look at the transfer of the human capital in terms of this component industry yeah, related to the uh, motorcycles, for example, of the automotive is relatively doing quite well. And why is that? The, 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 the answer is because the auto industry is part of the global production network. And for the for Indonesian, it's politically acceptable. Because if you're talking about production network, you are not talking about uh, reaping the benefit, the, the domestic market, because Indonesia is part of the production network. This is the thing that probably I suggest to the <coughs> relationship between Indonesia and Australia. If you want to do the cattle beef to Indonesia, the way you look at it, the way Indonesia look at this always you want to you know to get our market. But if we do it put it on the production network, then we are part of this global production network. The other thing, Chris, the thing that I have in mind, we probably need to look at the concept of the self sufficiency in a different way. I could imagine if the R and D is owned by Singapore or Australia. Why don't just Indonesian company do an acquisition for this company? Yeah, for example, if you're talking about if you are afraid of the self-sufficiency related to beef, why don't Indonesia take you know buy some shares in a beef company in Australia? So once we import, we import from our own company. Yeah, that kind of idea will somehow will link Indonesia into the production the production network. Of course, the the the, the first best solution is to have this foreign direct investment to come, the foreign workers to come, but this is politically still very difficult. So I, as I said that, at the given constraint, what kind of policy <coughs> still work? I hope I, 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 I answered your question. Thank you. The next, the next we've got Andrew Reddy. Thanks, Chair. <coughs> I have two questions. One is, both had two excellent talks today, and both of them came back very strong to the importance of human soil development. But whatever you do, though, keep being reminded of the study that Hal and the late Tate Kwan we did not so many years ago, at the really sorry state of the tertiary sector. And I'd, I'd like to hear your views about what, what are the there are other opportunities now, in a sense, to leapfrog the, if you like, relatively mediocre teaching strength you have at the universities and high schools, etc. Is there scope to use IT measurement? The second, the contrast between the two lectures was that Dr. Murray emphasized services far more than you did. He sort of went for, if not commodities, then manufacturing. Yeah. I think the distinction between the two is really weakening day by day, and also capital requirements for services. So I'd like to hear you, you on that sort of part of This is didn't elaborate on earlier. On the issue of education, I think um, this is a difficult issue in the sense that the way I look at the issue of education in Indonesia, uh, perhaps in the, in the, I would say the elementary school, the basic education, we probably need to provide uh, a certain standard of it that people get access. But if you're talking about <coughs> education, we need to talk about the quality. Yeah? And I think the role of government is rather limited if you're talking about the quality, to be honest. I was in the Silicon Valley about a month ago, and people from Google gave a presentation about doing projects. So what I'm afraid, what I learned from them, is the role of government become very limited because the innovation keeps coming almost every day, and there is no way the government regulation can catch up with this innovation. So if you're talking about this, about this, you know, the education system, perhaps that we can focus on the, you know, the the, the, the basic education, uh, but maybe for the quality in terms of higher level, then probably we need the participation. This is the thing that um, we probably fail to sort of like to convince uh, people. Uh, it is good to send our kids to study overseas, yeah? but maybe also important, we try to open up education in Indonesia, like what Malaysia does, like open
opening campus in Kuala Lumpur yeah. or Singapore. Yeah. I do believe that Ibu Mari also try very hard to convince a you know, colleague in the cabinet for this you know, opening up the uh, education sector and also the health sector. Billions of dollars <coughs> spent in Singapore for the health, for insurance, for education. Yeah, it's better to have them to come back. And this will give a technology spillover in Indonesia. So this is the thing that probably we need to do. But we need the critical mass. We need the critical mass if you're talking about the quality of education. <coughs> Unfortunately, in Asia, it's not enough. So when I was at the MOF, I started to come up with the idea, if people could publish in the top tier journal, then they will get a grant. Now the MOF implement this, but unfortunately, they put the impact factor six. So none, nobody you know, will get a grant. Because none of the economic journal will have an impact factor you know, beyond five. It's against, it's because bureaucracy doesn't really understand about the impact, what the impact factor is. But at least the scheme is there. Yeah. So the idea is how to sort of like to build the critical mass. On your second question, Andrew, this is very important. The way I look at the services sector, services should be an input for the manufacturer. Yeah, because if you're talking about uh, 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 logistics, for example, it should be part of the sort of like, you know, the, the, the manufacturing. So we are talking about the manufacturing sector. One of the issues <coughs> would be the logistics. Yeah, so we, we put the issue of the, the services sector integrated in the, as the part of the manufacturing. But at the same time, I could see that the future of Indonesia <coughs> depends so much on the services. Why is that with the growing middle class, the young population, I could imagine the three type of business <coughs> would be very lucrative for Indonesia. This will be education, health, and also maybe the lifestyle. And this is the things that you know, has to do with the uh, services industry. Unfortunately, <coughs> to be honest with you, we really lag behind in terms of services, even the data. We don't have the data. You know? So we need to compile data on services, still very, still very difficult. I was going to say, uh, I, I hope we could propose in this impact factor that study that the goals of the Indonesian Economic Studies can be improved. Uh, next we have uh, Asif Suri Hadi, and welcome also to Asif, the head of a wonderful institute called the Sneru Research Institute. Thank you, Andre. Uh, anyway, I would like to ask about something which uh, they did not talk about, but I think it's very related to uh, the topic, which is inequality. We all know that during the past decade, Indonesia experienced an increase in inequality. If you look at uh, monetary indicators, it's not to worry because actually everybody is still better off. Only the top 50% grew much faster than the bottom 50%. But if you look at non-monetary indicators such as malnutrition or access to <coughs> clean water, actually the bottom 10% they are getting worse off during the past decade. So my question is, can we still achieve a, a high country if we ignore this problem. Thank you. Thank you, Asad. This is a very good question. Um, I didn't touch yeah, uh, I didn't touch the issue of this equality because we would like to focus on the you know the issue of the human capital here. But I agree with you. If you look at the, the indicators of the inequality, it's becoming you know uh, uh, it's become uh, really a big issue in the future. And the way I look at this situation, of course, if you're talking about inequality, one of the solutions is, I mentioned in my presentation, is providing the infrastructure, you know, access for infrastructure, or for example, like the access for water, electricity, etc. But the other things, um, the question is, why the Gini coefficient? I'm not, I'm not, an, I'm, I'm not pretending to be an expert on everything. This is, this is my, my, my own view. I'm not an expert on this, you know, issue of poverty. I'd like to hear your view as well. Why the Gini coefficient increased substantially after 2004, 2003, uh, up to until 2013? Perhaps this has to do with the government policy and also the resource pool. The first one, I would like to, to, to hear your views as well. Yes. The first one is the rigidity in the labor market. 
I could imagine because the governments, you know, uh, submitted the uh, labor law in 2003. Uh, there will be a shift from this labor intensive industry into the capital intensive industry. And many companies perhaps try to avoid the labor intensive, go to the capital intensive. This is a simple production, you know, if you're talking about the production function. You see the relative price is relatively cheap. As a result, in return on this you know, capital intensive industry, relative to the wages, increase quite substantial. And I could imagine this will have an impact on the on the inequality. The second one, uh, but of course we, uh, we are focused on the on the on the capital intensive, it will continue to push those. The second one is with the resource pool. If you look at it's very interesting, just some um, very anecdotal evidence. If you look at the top 50 bridges in Indonesia, <coughs> most of them are actually people who own natural resources companies. They you know, own the palm oil, the kelapa sawit, coal, basically the mining industry. So you could see, you know, the resource pool also create this problem because it's again attract the, the resources from the manufacturing <coughs> into the, the, the resources sector. So I think, you know, if you're talking about uh, issue of inequality, I agree with you. you know, we probably not only need to focus on the high economic growth, but also the issue of inequality. And one of the solutions is perhaps, as I mentioned in my presentation, but I'm not really sure whether it is politically acceptable, is to sort of like to uh, make the labor market become less rigid. I'm not saying that become flexible. Yeah, because it's very difficult in a country like, like France. They are not able to sort of like to implement the reform on the, on the labor market. We keep talking in the G20 about labor market reform, but I don't think any country you know, uh, are able to deliver the, the, the labor market, with the, the flexible labor market reform. Um, the second one is there is a hope with the declining commodity prices. We will see the reverse effect of the Dutch disease. And my, I hope I was right, and my prediction is somehow it will improve the distribution <coughs> in the future as well. I don't know, this is, you know, I'd like to hear from, learn from you as well. Yeah, uh, I think that's uh, it was an invitation, but there they said, to hear from you again. You want to do an elaboration? You are, after all, the leading, the leading authority on this subject. You want to comment further? You're welcome to, if you like. Sorry. Uh, I agree very much with your analysis that uh, the labor law and the uh, commodity boom are contributing importantly to the increase in inequality. Uh, but I think there's another one uh, important policy factor, which is in the monetary policy, because we, during the past decade, we have uh, appreciating real exchange rate, which uh, hit our, the competitiveness of our manufacturing industry and that feeds back into the unskilled labor. Uh, that's also one another thing to think about. Thank you. Thank you. Can I interject in the debate? So are you meaning to say, uh, Hasid, that you would have done exchange rate policy differently? The appreciation of exchange rate. Yeah. Yes, that's what you said. Yes. The appreciation of the exchange rate. Real exchange rate. Real exchange rate. Yeah. Real. If you look at the data, the Indonesian is very sensitive. has been increasing. Yeah, no, I, I, I got that bit, but are you implying that they should have done exchange rate policy differently, or is it just the inevitable consequence of that commodity move? Well, uh, we have to discuss that, but I think that's one of the important contributing factors to reduce the competitiveness of uh, unskilled labor manufacturing in Indonesia, which hits the problem. <coughs> sure. Sure. You have to access it to the precinct. That's what you, you, you suggest. Right? By implication, yeah. yeah. It's the gas coming if you mentioned it. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I don't want to be accused of a right wing bias, so questions are welcome from this side of the room, please, in case I'm listening. Yeah, uh, my name is Hibi Pribadi. I am WDP OLD. Thank you, Bakati. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question that I'm asking about the opinion. How about the current economic policy under the Jokowi's administration? Is that already in line with what you have proposed? The second one is like, how about Jokowi, Jokowi's infrastructure reform? 
is that the domestic supply is it enough to answer the policy? And I'm wondering that we need to import more. Thank you. Big question. Big question, and I better be careful. In <laughs> First, I think we are not living in the empty space. That's very important, yeah? Because as an economist, sometimes we always look at, as I mentioned to you earlier, living in the first class world. Because the institutional setup is always very important. And I could, I could understand, I could imagine my colleague Martha Smith, as political scientist, is here. Every new administration would like to demonstrate they are different from the previous administration. And this is very normal. They would like to show there is a radical departure from the previous one. So, uh, usually in the beginning of the new administration, they always come up with a series of policies to show that they are different from the other. If you look at the case of Brazil, if you recall Cardoso, he was the one who invented the dependency theory. But the first thing he did when he became president of Brazil is to dip to do the privatization. <laughs> so, so my point is, in the beginning, we will see that series, you know, maybe the government can, can set a very ambitious target, but at the end of the day, in the medium term, every president become a normal president, every cabinet become a normal cabinet. <laughs> a normal country. A uh, normal country. What does it mean? It means that if Jokowi later on would like to achieve 7% economic growth. There is no way this could be achieved without being open. Open to the regime, open for energy investment. Why? Because simply, the investment cannot be financed because our domestic saving is not enough. But this cannot be done within the short period of time when the mood of the spirit of this campaign mode is still there. But later on, they will become a normal president, a normal cabinet, just a normal country. Yeah, so, so, so I wouldn't expect something that really happened drastically. But of course, as a politician, you need to come up that, you know, that you can, you can change the world in one night. Yeah, otherwise, you will not become a politician, you will not be elected. Yeah, if you said that, if I become a president, then it takes about five years, maybe years, continue to grow between five to six percent, you won't be elected. You'll become a lecturer at the university. <laughs> <laughs> and that's always that's the risk for higher economists to become a minister of funds like <laughs> because always come up with a with a reality check. Um, that's that's the what is what, what is your your second question? Uh, like uh, always import uh, infrastructure if that is supply side uh, it's enough to the domestic supply side. You're talking about the source of financing? Yeah. Yeah. Like the, the capital, the uh, <laughs> yes. like, uh, cement, like... Uh, oh, I see. Okay. In terms of financing, we are talking about... Let me start with the financing first. We are talking about 500 billion US dollars. And the government is only able to finance about maximum 15% of it. So the rest should come from private sector. Yeah? Either the public-private partnership, or you invite the, the private sector to invest on infrastructure. In terms of this, in terms of this um, um, raw materials, there's always a risk in the short term when you do the infrastructure project, then immediately it will hit your current deficit. Why? Because capital goods, raw materials, you need to import. But you, you, you probably need to look at on the medium terms. Once the infrastructure in place, then it will, you know, it will generate growth. So, as long as you know you import something for something, uh, you import goods for something productive. You don't need to worry about it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I wonder at this juncture, uh, Buddy, would you like to say a few words uh, on any subject related to what we've been discussing or anything else? I think we're going to hear from Buddy tomorrow evening, and then I think there's a special session with the Indonesian student community on Friday. But yeah. For this audience, would you like to say a few words on that? <laughs> I, I should mention that uh, that would have just come on over that, an overnight flight, so we're very grateful that you're willing to be here. Okay, now, thanks. Hi, Didi.
Uh, my appreciation for your speech. I'm, I'm a bit behind in terms of theories and so on, so forgive me that if I, my comments are not on uh, that point. <laughs> it sounds like a cabinet meeting. <laughs> One is you have to survive in the short run. That means you have to be able to get through all these uh, challenges, short term challenges. All this uh, you have to be able to uh, ride over crisis. There are so many uh, possibilities of crisis, big one, small one. Just as in the case of earthquake, you know that it will come, but you don't know when and how it. This is the dangerous global of the world that we live in, in terms of the economic management. So I think if you want to avoid this threat, you have to uh, develop a strategy lead you through this dangerous uh, path. So you have to survive. That means you have to develop framework, policy framework. You have to develop uh, institution that will uh, ensure that you will survive in this uh, dangerous world that we live in. I don't want to go into detail, but you know what I mean. <laughs> uh, in the of financial uh, sector, what we should do, and, and so on. And the, the challenges that we are facing at the moment are both uh, slowing down of the economy, that means kind of real sector threat, but also possibility of financial uh, sector upheaval or uh, challenges that you have to face from a sudden uh, turnaround of uh, capital movement and this kind of thing. Those need to be addressed by the present government. Do, uh, could be prevented. Uh, the second is focus on the really uh, long, long issues that really matter in terms of your development. Okay? And those things are actually long-term in nature. Very long. And unfortunately, poli the political system in well, democracy in almost everywhere that does not lead you to focus on the long-term factors that matter for your development. These, uh, these factors I, I would like to uh, compress into three things. And I, I mentioned this to students 
living at home, and I use the Indonesian logical way to simplify things. I, I mentioned that you need to develop three eyes. E. One is inside. Is you have not uh, thought through really what, what do you mean by uh, developing the quality of your uh, human resources? It means, in my view, you have to produce an entirely different, different set of human, human beings, <coughs> a new generation with new way of thinking. It sounds like uh, something unachievable, I think it should be achievable if you integrate all your uh, programs within the framework of creating new human being. New generation doesn't have to be super superman, super human being, but something that necessarily better must be better in every aspect compared to the present uh, generation. That, that has implications for policies, not just uh, uh, doing uh, what you call bits and pieces of improving your education, bits and pieces of improving your health program. It must be a kind of integrated uh, strategy organizing uh, thing to for our human resource development program. The second I is institution. It's also cliche, but again, the real world <coughs> needs institution, whatever you do. Institution that will ensure your goal will be achieved. Not just policies, but institutions. Something more, uh, a bit more permanent. Institutions, so many institutions, of course, but I think I agree with Ben Rodriguez when he commented uh, that it is politics, stupid. <laughs> like uh, Clinton said, it's economics, stupid. My own personal experience is that politics is the key where everything, the basic rules of the game are decided, laws, important uh, policy decisions and so on. So there must be really a, a strategy to as such does not guarantee that you will have a good, a good policy uh, outcome. As I mentioned, I touched on about the, the possibility of focusing on the short-term issues all the time, forgetting about the long-term factors that matter for you, really matter for you. Human resources. Well, there are programs, but I think we should integrate it in, the, in, the, in the a long term perspective examination. Institution, it is a long term program also. I think politics is the key. The second is, in my view, is bureaucracy. 
this is very crucial to improve the institution as we call democracy. Many good intentions, many good policies are frustrated because they are not implemented. Many examples as, as you may in real life. So I think improvement in bureaucracy is a must. There are many ways to do that. It is a long-term effort. It's not five-yearly program. So then coming back to the political process again. Of course, focus on short-term five-yearly programs are <coughs> not suited for improving or developing institutions like bureaucracy. That is ice infrastructure. I think you are right. That is key. It is again it's a, not just a short term issue how to push the implementation of one or two or three projects, existing projects, but it is about planning your economy. Planning foundation, physical foundation of the economy, so that you will achieve an efficient, productive economy. You need a long-term plan for infrastructure, especially for Indonesia. I think you need a long-term plan for improving the connectivity within Indonesia. Well, you should not forget about your connectivity with of Indonesia, with other countries. But I think the first priority for Indonesia is to have a really uh, integrating infrastructure for the economy. If you are talking about NKRI politically, <coughs> it's nonsense. If you are not facing that, or uh, connectivity of the economy. It's just nonsense. So I think the uh, Satuan and the economy itself is, is so important. It is not a short term or five yearly program, but it is uh, 25, 10, 50 years program how to develop a network of sea transport <coughs> that will be relevant for all these aircraft. So I agree with you that uh, middle income threat may be just one of those threats. And if you dramatize with some name, then you can call it middle income threat. But <coughs> basically, you have to deal with two things. One is how to survive in the short run. That means a framework of Once you get into a crisis, the cost may be so high that it will uh, get you back 10 years. Example 1998, it, it moved us back, backward for 10 years in terms of integrating uh, many things, including per capita income and so on. So I think you have to have uh, a framework for that. Human resource development, it is a generation change, not just how to improve uh, the affordable uh, uh, student participation rate from year to year. No. I'm talking something outside this, but that's what I like to say. Thank you. Because you've only had that word. If that's, a, if that's an indication of the quality of cabinet discussions in Indonesia, <laughs> it would have been a very good cabinet to be in. Um, and maybe that's the first chapter of your <laughs> memoir book. <laughs> okay, we run close to the end of the time, but we still have a little bit more time for a couple more questions. And I'm looking over there and I 
where um, <coughs> to the right wing I haven't seen any. Yet. Any questions over there? Uh, yeah, say that. I don't know whether this is going to be an economics question or something else. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, probably there's not about economy since I don't know anything about it. But the one thing that it did he talk about economy, I can understand. <laughs> so it means that uh, he can simplify things. Um, I, I want to ask you your comment, for the comment on the civil society and academy. Because you're part of this movement of civil society in the 1980s and you seem to be very optimistic, but your uh, comment now seems to be very pessimistic. What's going on with the civil society? <laughs> Well, I think um, in, in my paper, I specifically focus on the issue of this um, globalization. Yeah? If you're talking about uh, good governance, the green government, I believe that everyone has the same uh, platform for that. But once you touch the issue of the globalization, I think the position of the civil society is quite diverse related to that. Because um, this may be something related to the to the ideological issue, yeah, whether this globalization is good or not. And the reality is when we look at the decision making process, yeah, uh, well, probably it's too simplistic. But let me put it this way. You've never heard a group of NGO working on how to pursue for free trade. How good is globalization? You never heard. We never see anyone go for a demonstration on the street to support free trade. Yeah? This is a very interesting question because as a consumer, they are benefited by that. But because everyone get a benefit, nobody would like to, to put an effort to fight for the globalization because we take it for granted. But you know the, the ideological issue related to the globalization, uh, perhaps that's something very appealing because we are thinking that probably we can protect people, to support people, and probably this is a position that maybe my good friends from the NGO you know, are talking about. Yeah. With, uh, so basically, if you're talking about, you know, in terms of globalization, the position, this formal position, is against that. But interestingly, once they become government, they are no longer talking about this globalization. <laughs> Every presidential candidate criticized the fuel price adjustment, but all of them, once they become a president, they adjust the price. So I think maybe. The, 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 the explanation behind it is perhaps the political, the, the, the reality, the policy reality, perhaps is a bit, you know, um, not very connected with the sort of like ideological thinking. Um, I may have, you may have a different view with me. I don't really believe that this policy in Indonesia really driven by the ideological issue. The neoliberal, the leftist issue, it's simply because pragmatic. Why you just the view press? Simply because you don't have money. That's nothing to do with the with the ideology. In Indonesia, ideology is a result, not uh, not uh, a cause, not the origin of making a policy. So when you make a decision about adjusting the view price, then you'll be classified as neoliberal. But not because you are neoliberal, you are adjusting the view price. So this is something that perhaps friends from the NGO always look at the issue of the globalization. I think maybe, maybe on that hopeful note, uh, we might draw proceedings to a close. Um, we've had two, or well, two and a half, fascinating presentations on the Indonesian e economy today by people who've got uh, not just intellectual knowledge, but the real experience uh, running, how to run economic policy in a big and com complex democracy. And we've just heard a wonderful presentation from Lene on some of the challenges looking forward. So can you please join me in thanking you very much.